The word power in our society has come to have kind of a bad connotation, you know, like power trips and power struggles and power plays. Like it's like trying to keep us from having our, our freedoms or our rights. And so it's difficult sometimes to talk about being a great leader and thinking about it in terms of power. It's like we're, we're thinking of, of things in almost a military fashion. And yet, power has a whole other side to it. If you think about electric power, like power is energy, that it is the current that passes between uh, different units to make, make things work. Power is something that is a good lens to have in contrast to some of the others that we look for in leadership roles. So with, with that in mind, our definition of power comes from the idea that we cannot actually control other people. Emotional intelligence says, I can control myself. I can only influence others. And so power takes that one step farther. Power is not actually the influence, but the idea that you have potential to influence others if you have power. Uh, Pfeffer, in his, in his book, Managing Power, probably has my favorite definition of what it is. It's the potential ability to influence behavior. You also, with power to change events, if you are powerless, events you are reacting to. You also think about in the idea of power of overcoming resistance. And this comes up again as we talk about changing things for the better. There's always going to be some that drag their heels, that that defy, that, that subtly uh, go in opposite ways and, and don't align with what's going on. And so if you're looking at it through a lens of power, you think of that term as being resistance. And finally, power is the potential ability to get people to do things they would not otherwise do. And you think about power as a parent, power as a citizen, power as a teacher. It, you can see that that's, that's what power is in any of those roles to get people to do things that they would not otherwise do. And it's true in leadership as well. Now the book does a nice job of talking through French and Raven's five types of power. If I were power teaching this, the first one I, that I would do for legitimate power would I would be showing you a salute. So you can, you can uh, at home or at work or wherever you are, you can salute right now to remind yourself that legitimate power is, is the type of power that comes from the job from the title. That's when you say, why, do, why should I do it? And you say, because I'm the daddy, because the superintendent said so. You know, those are our, our manifestation of legitimate power. In our society, legitimate power has some difficulties now in that people question it much more than, than they used to. You know, I, I, I would go with my grandparents to, to the doctor, and if the doctor said, take the purple pill, my grandparents would just say, how often and how many? If I go with my parents to the, to the doctor and then he says, take the, the purple pill, they start to question. They no longer just say, because you're the doctor, I'm going to answer that. And so they would question the doctor and say, why am I taking this? How, you know, what's this doing for me? Now, if the doctor says to me, take the purple pill, I'm going to go out and do a Google search on the internet and look for all of the drug interactions and see what people are saying about it and really question that authority. That doesn't mean I don't believe in the doctor's authority, but it isn't the, the straightforward, general to private type of, of authority that we had in our culture in a previous century. It doesn't mean it's gone. You still do things because the principal said so. You still do things because the police officer tells you to. We do have legitimate power. It is just not usually the primary power that motivates people to be influenced. Expert power is. Now, if I were power teaching that, I'd just put my finger and tap my forehead and say, expert, that, you know, I'm going to do what you say because you you have some knowledge that I don't have. I I know you know more about it than I do. Expert power we believe in. We even believe in silly things on television that says, chew this gum because four out of five dentists tell us that. Why do we say dentists? Well, they're the, they should know about teeth. They should know whether we should chew the gum or not. And we don't even question how, what study was that, how many dentists did they ask, and what did that fifth dentist say? But 
we we believe in statistics. We believe in in tested facts. We we uh, are sometimes limited by our ability to to judge if we just follow expert power. But it is something that you can use if you have the knowledge. You can use that to influence others. So. Sometimes people think that they're going to become a school leader. They have to know everything, and they have to say answers. Some people come and says, what should we do about this? And you know nothing about it. You think, I've got to show expert power. I have to show I know. Well, here's the nice secret. You don't have to know how to do everything. There's no way that you're going to know how to teach every class, answer every situation, work with every family. The answer is not, I know. The an and then the answer isn't just, I don't know either. The answer is, I'll find out. Because the expert power you're using then is not the technical power of being able to solve the problem, but you have the network around you that you have somebody you can call, a source you can go to, to get the expertise to the person, even if it's not you. you know, I'll, I'll direct you to the counselor. I will uh, get some information and come back to you and answer it. You still show expert power. And sometimes you say, I don't know that because you're building trust, but you follow that up with gaining that expertise. You just don't let it hang there as well. Referent power is also powerful within our society. Referent power, I would power teach by, by uh, putting my hand over my heart because it's, it's an emotional thing. It's, I want to be like you. That's why they put uh, the Olympics, the, every commercial seemed to have Michael Phelps selling you know everything from shaving lotion to swimming pools and things that he knew you know well I could I could understand why Michael Phelps could sell me a swimming pool but I'm not quite sure how much shaving lotion he can sell uh, probably a lot but what does he know about shaving any more than anybody else but people look to him as a hero and they don't stop to think He's influencing me into something that maybe he doesn't have that expert power on at all. We see referent power a lot in education. You now the student says to you, well, well, I'll, I'll do it for you. I'll do it for you, Miss Kaiser, they used to tell me. And I'm like, if you're going to do it for me, why wouldn't you do it for the next teacher and the, t and the principal? And the it's because they wanted to have that. It was coming out of the relationship, and they didn't have the relationship with those other people. And so referent power works, but sometimes it only works as far as your uh, influence goes, and it doesn't go into all aspects. You know, I could, I could get my students to be influenced for me, but then they'd go home and do something else entirely because the influence in the, in the community was, it was entirely different. They would work for me, but it, when it was homework time, other influences. Well, the same thing's true. Referent power in school leadership has a minimal field of which it will work. You have to have a relationship to make it work. Reward power and coercive power. I'd hold out my hand in power teaching and, and hold it out like for the prize, for the reward. We understand that. Do this and you will get whatever. So I turn my hand over and give it my hand a slap and say that's that's coercive power. I put my hand in that way because they're, they're opposite side of the same coin. You see, if I don't give you a reward, you feel punished. But with, with holding up a reward feels like a punishment, coercive. And the opposite of true, not getting punished is, an, is implied to be a reward. So they work back and forth with one another. Do these work? Absolutely. How, how many times do you reward yourself by giving yourself little little uh, incentives to make things happen. How many times do you try to, to create incentives or, or uh, consequences for those that you're trying to influence? We do that with children all the time. The problem with that is it's like a Band-Aid. It only works, it works fast. It stops the bleeding. It will change the behavior, but it doesn't last. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that when we look uh, at the the outcomes of these five, five uh, fields. But at this time, you're going to run back to your simulation one last time. And this time, you're going to look for examples of the five kinds of power. They all won't be there. 
Some of them will be in much more prevalent than the other. Remember, it's all your perception. There is no right or wrong. It's how you see it. So the thing is to think about why you did what you did. And then secondly, why you're, you're choosing to market in the way that you are. And it's that learning that, that makes this worthy of, of your work. And when you're finished with it this time, it's ready to be printed out and brought to class. So I say about the Band-Aid that, that reward and coercive only works for a little while. You know, even if you set up the greatest reward system there ever was for a school, we're going to give out tokens for this, or we're going to give out, out uh, certificates for that, or whatever those things are. The shine goes off of those after a while, and they find their, the loopholes in those kinds of systems. And also, if, you're, if you try to lead people through fear by coercive power, they resent that, and it builds up resistance. This is the work of Yukel. And if you look at this chart, you can see that he divides it into whether you're trying to lead for commitment. In a commitment, they will continue to do it because they believe in it. Even if you left the building or left the job, they would continue to do what you were we're leading them to do because they have now taken ownership of whatever that action is. Referent power leads to that. Expert power leads to that. Coercive power does not. Reward power does not. I think about all the, the little slips I gave out to give kids free pizzas for reading books when I was in the elementary schools. They'd come in and say they read a book, and I'd write them a coupon for, for a pizza. Reward power, right? 
What was the point? We wanted them to read more books. Well, the thing is, that didn't match up to the reprise turning over into the behavior. Because if it were true, then if, if this reward power worked, we would not continue to need to give out pizza certificates. They would learn to love to read. If they quit reading as soon as you stop giving out the certificates, then they really are not committed to it. They are over in the next column. They are complying. You want me to, to read to get the pizza? I'll read as long as I get the pizza, but as soon as I don't, I quit. And you can see that that legitimate power, doing it because the boss says so, and reward power, I'm doing it for the prize, only lasts as long as the boss is there or the prize is there. Finally, the idea of resistance, of rebelling against it. If you're leading by fear, you can move people quickly. You know, with a little toddler that you don't want to go out in the street, you're going to give them a little swat so that they, you don't sit there and, and say, because I'm the mother, don't run out in the street, or, or because because you love me, don't run out in the street. You're going you're gonna to give a coercive piece to that idea of running out in the street that they aren't going to forget. But the thing is, we resent that over time. People will, will sabotage the efforts. They will, they will form groups that, you know, faculties will have the, the meeting after the meeting in the parking lot and decide what they're really going to do. You know, that there will be a resistance if you're leading by fear. It works fast. It works in a short, if you have a short uh, teaching that you want to, that you, uh, that you want to change your behavior. But over the long time, it leads to a very uh, toxic relationship. Before I leave the idea of power, I want, to know that, want you to know there's other people besides uh, French and Raven who have looked at types of power. Mins Mintzberg has a real interesting one. And that is, it, you get your power. Where does your power come from? And he says it comes from from having uh, a technical skill, a body of knowledge, or access to the resources. Yeah. And this way, you kind of think about, about um, some of those other intangibles about how people gather power. I think about uh, one of the uh, technology teachers that I worked with in my career that would use that ability to sign the computers or fix the computers to parlay it into a being able to make decisions about things like schedules and um, many other intangible things about supplies and because you didn't want to get on that person's bad side or you'd be at the bottom of the list. They had the resources, they had the technical skills that, that you didn't have, so to get what you needed you had to comply with what it is that they were looking for. It's also interesting to talk about in his perspective about who gets to talk to power? You know, do you get to walk into the superintendent's office and explain what's going on? Do you have access to that? Do you, or, or is that some, you know, in some school districts that's true, and in others there's there's some layers in between that, and you don't have access to that power. So it's another way of assessing and looking at power itself. Authority comes from power, but it's a different. It's like looking through the opposite end of the telescope, is what I usually say. Power is what you are looking at, your influence, your potential to influence. Authority is given to someone. I will, why do I do what that police officer says? Because I have agreed to be a citizen of this country and hopefully everybody else will follow what that, that uh, officer says. Why do, we, why do we follow the laws that Congress has enacted? Because we have given our right to make those decisions over to the, our elected officials so that we don't have to do it. So authority is your willingness to give somebody their power and follow what it is that they say. Sometimes it's formal, like the police officer or the congressperson. That is a formal piece of authority. Sometimes it's informal. I can, I'll bet you that you can think about within your extended family who the one or two or three most powerful uh, individuals are, and it's because informally the other members of the group follow or give in or listen to those people. Same thing's true on your faculty. There are formal authorities, team leader, 
principle, whatever those, those formal pieces are. And there's also the informal ones, the one you, that you go run down the hall and say, what, what should we do? And they don't necessarily have that formal authority at all. Now, sometimes those are both in the, within the same person, and sometimes they're different people, but look how that falls out. If they have both formal and informal authority, the group says, yes, you're the leader, and, and the, the norms of the society also says, we give this person the title of leader. Then they are formally a leader. But there are informal leaders that don't have any title. That goes back to our thought that we had the first night, that everybody can be and should think of themselves in terms of leadership. Those that have formal authority but do not have the informal authority, that's, that's the assistant principal that, that puts out the policy and sticks it up on the, on the bulletin board and they, everybody ignores it. They, they have the formal authority, but the informal authority isn't following it. It's pretty hollow. And lastly, the biggest group should be that last one, followers. If we are having more leaders than followers, then we're, we're expending energy that we shouldn't be doing. There's nothing the matter with being fo a follower in, if you're paying attention to why you're following your leaders and not just blindly following them. Margaret Thatcher said being in power is like being a lady. If you have to tell people you are, you aren't. If you have to go around and say, I'm the boss, I'm the parent, I'm the teacher, then something is missing. The, the power is an energy that we know it's there, and we don't have to explain it to anybody because the, the way the group operates, we know where the power is. You can go into any kindergarten class that's been meeting for two weeks, and the children within there will know where the power is. They know the power of the teacher, the legitimate power. They know the power of, of the, the parent and the aide, and it, but they also know within the group which students hold the power. It's part of our DNA. We, we know what power is all about.